But we're going to look a little more at this section of Scripture tonight. And this time we want to look at it from the point of view of kingdom values as kingdom treasure. Because this is just another way of seeing the dichotomy or the difference between how the world sees things and how Messiah taught us to see things. And there's just a huge difference between the two things. And you know what? Even though we're believers, sometimes we don't even realize it, but we're kind of affected by the world. And sometimes we adopt some of the world's thinking about things without realizing that's what we're doing. And actually, what usually happens is we learned these things earlier, and we just haven't gotten to changing them yet because it takes time. So let's look at a few things here. Messiah was essentially building his kingdom, and he chose the 12, and then he chose the 70, and he was building his kingdom. And then in the end of chapter 11, he's talking to the Pharisees, and basically he is firing them. That's basically what's happening. He's the king, right? And he's telling them the reasons why he's firing them. And that's basically what's happening. He's firing them. And so he tells them all these woes that are going to happen to them. They didn't like that. And so they started plotting against him at this point. Well, when he was doing this, it was very public. And you know, this is one exception. Normally, we don't do this kind of thing publicly, right? But in the case of these guys, it had to be public. Because first of all, Yeshua was acting in an official position as the Messiah, as the king. And these men had been the leaders over the people. And so all the people had to know what was happening. And they had to know the reason. Because we're talking here about a change of administration, aren't we? So he was very open, telling them all of this, and they did not receive it, and they felt they were more powerful than him because they had the political power, and so they immediately began plotting. Well, while this was going on, what was happening is that the people who were there were watching this, and so, you know, one said to the other, oh, you know, run and get Aunt Martha. She wants to see this. Oh, you know, Uncle Joe, he wants to see this. So that by the time we get to Luke, the first chapter, the people are running there to watch the spectacle of him dressing down these religious leaders. And so much so, there's thousands there. The Greek word actually means 10,000 that are there watching this trampling on each other to get close enough to see it. This was an amazing spectacle. For one reason why it was so amazing is because these men had power. And yet, Yeshua was unafraid. And probably the same thing could not be said of his disciples. You know, it doesn't tell us what happened with them, but I'm thinking probably they're watching this and they're thinking, oh boy, we're in trouble now because we just made enemies out of the people who they'll kill us. How would you feel? And when you understand this background, you can understand why he turns to them as his friends. And he kind of calms them down, saying, I tell you, my friends, calming down their fears. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body. He's telling them that because they are afraid of those who kill the body. Sometimes we're afraid of those who kill the body, aren't we? It's a natural thing 
to fear evil people that want to kill you. That's not strange to feel that way. But he reminds us the reason. And he says that we should fear him who not only can kill us, but can throw us into Gehenna, eternal fire. And then he shows us that if we fear Elohim, he is not going to forget us. He doesn't forget the birds. He's not going to forget us. Every hair of your head is numbered. Some of us have a bigger number than others. But however many there are, he knows them. And so he reiterates, don't be afraid. So these are kingdom values. You can't fake that. You have to believe it for it to be true. Right? You can't fake that. So it involves really a changed heart to not fear death. And it requires fear of Elohim. You know, this is why I worry for some people who confess to believe in Messiah today, because there's very little fear of God. There's such a preponderance of the idea of easy grace that many times people don't fear God. And you see those two things go together. For you not to fear evil, you must fear God more. That's what he's saying. At the same time that you realize that God cares for you. Elohim cares for you. He will take care of you in every situation. That's kingdom treasure. Now, right there, he knows they're about to be challenged. People are going to say to them, well, did you see what that guy did? Are you going to keep following him after he did that? Isn't it very likely that would happen with that crowd? So before it even happened, he says this to his disciples, I tell you, everyone who confesses me before men, him will the Son of Man also confess before the angels of Elohim. You know, one day, Messiah is going to come with all of his angels. And all of those who have truly confessed him and been his will be raised from the graves, or if they're still alive, they'll be changed. And the scriptures tell us the angels are actually going to gather them together to meet Messiah in the clouds. Imagine that. What is that if not Messiah confessing you, not only before the angels, but even before the whole world? Huge. It's a huge thing. Well, he mentions the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And you know, I've heard some folks say, I'm afraid that I've blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And they're in fear about it. And all I can tell you is, if you're afraid you've done it, you haven't done it. Because the people who do this have hearts that are hardened against God. Those people think they're perfect already. They're self-righteous people, and they wouldn't have that fear. So if anybody's worried about that, that proves you haven't done it. <laughs> and, of course, we're promised here about the Holy Spirit. This part, I think, is interesting, because... He's saying all this, and then he says, 
when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, and the authorities. Foregone conclusion. You know this is going to happen. He's saying this to them, right? You saw what I just said. You're with me. When they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, and the authorities, does that apply to you? Are you ready for that? If you are going to follow Yeshua Messiah to the end, be ready for that. You know, your only other way out when this happens, you can rat on all your brothers and be a blasphemer and a traitor. Basically a Judas. That might be your way out of those people that kill the body. This is why we have to think of these things ahead of time and work this stuff out in our heart because we don't want to end up in that place. We don't want to end up there. So he says, when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers, and the authorities, don't be anxious how or what you will answer or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that same hour what you must say. Don't even worry about it, about what you're going to say. Amazing, isn't it? You can trust that. But you know, the only way that you can ever experience that is by being faithful. When they take you before the synagogues, the rulers, and the authorities, and they ask you to give an account for yourself, open your mouth, and it'll all come out. Well, after this advice, one of the multitude spoke to him. Rabbi, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, the first thing I'd like to say about this is, what does this have to do with what Messiah was saying? Anything? This guy is a selfish bore. He doesn't care at all what Messiah is saying. He's got an issue. He wants to get his issue settled. That's the reason he's there. And he's telling Messiah what to do. He's not saying, could you please help me? He's saying, Rabbi, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Interrupting the whole spiritual flow of what's going on. And you notice I made the comment here, asking others to take sides is wrong. Why do people do that? They have some issue with somebody. In this case, this guy had an issue with his brother. And in front of everybody, he's asking Messiah to take sides with him against his brother. Well, look at what Yeshua said. Man, who made me a judge or an arbiter over you? Wouldn't that be a good answer when somebody asked you to do that? You know, this is a case that this man could rightly take to court if he's got a real case, right? Israel has courts. Why is he taking it to Yeshua to get Yeshua to do it? Well, Yeshua says essentially here, this is none of my business. Isn't that what he's saying? 
Essentially, the man is trying to use Yeshua to get what he wants. Yeshua didn't buy it. Perhaps he was thinking of Proverbs 26, 17, or like verse. Like one who grabs a dog's ears is one who passes by and meddles in a quarrel not his own. You know, you just get in trouble for yourself when you jump in the middle of somebody else's quarrel. Big mistake. Yeshua knew that. He didn't get trapped in that. But it happens a lot. This happens a lot. Then Yeshua says, Beware, keep yourselves from covetousness, for a man's life doesn't consist of the abundance of the things which he possesses. So why is Yeshua now talking about covetousness? Who was covetous here? This man was covetous, wasn't he? Interrupting the spiritual flow of the conversation because of his own anxiety about his inheritance and his issue with his brother. He wants what his brother's got. Maybe it's his and maybe it isn't. Well, we can learn a lot from this little lesson because it really helps to speak to all of us about how we should be interacting with our brothers. And basically what this man is doing is he's trying to use the leverage of social pressure. In other words, his brother is not giving him what he wants. And so he's trying to use the social pressure of getting an influential person to come onto his side in front of everybody to publicly shame his brother into doing what his brother doesn't want to do or doesn't think is right. Now, if you're confronted with a person that behaves like this and they want to get you to take their side, here's a question to ask yourself. Why is this person using these tactics of manipulation if they're right? If they're right, are they going to need to get people on their side? So you can see why Messiah didn't want anything to do with this. It wasn't his business, and he didn't want to be used by this man like this. And, you know, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because we live during a time period when a lot of these simple kind of things, which are like simple discernment, are totally lost. We're living in a time where, well, just go on the Internet sometimes and read comments under people's videos and stuff. People will say absolutely anything. They try to manipulate other people all the time, even like well-known Leaders and people like this, they're doing this all the time. They're using manipulation tactics all the time. And so it's real easy to pick up this kind of thinking. But in the kingdom, this is not how the kingdom operates. We don't use these kind of tactics. We don't try to leverage other people in order to get our way, you know, like politicians or something. So this is why Messiah just wasn't going to have anything to do with that. Well, there is another way that they do it. Campaigning. I think such and such a person is wrong. So... I just start campaigning through the congregation and try to get as many people as I can to agree with me. Maybe I'm thinking that the other person's doing the same thing, so if I get more people on my side, 
then I'll be the winner. But if I don't do it, I'm afraid they're doing it, and then I'll be the one that looks bad. All of that thinking, all that kind of thinking, that's the world. That's not how things operate in the kingdom. And it's manipulation. Now, a person who is a spiritually minded person, when they see that happen, and they see someone who's campaigning to get people on their side, what they're going to think is, well, wait a minute. Why is this person campaigning like this to get people on their side? After all, the scriptures show us the majority is usually wrong, and they want to get the majority on their side. So what is the likelihood that they're really wrong? You follow me? It's exactly the opposite of the way the world thinks. Because like on the internet, you know, if you're on Facebook and you're writing things so you've got 5 million people following your Facebook, then that makes you more right than the person who's quoting Yeshua who's got 5 people looking at his Facebook. That's Facebook. That's the world. That's not the kingdom. In the kingdom, we don't care about numbers because, you know what, they're totally irrelevant. There's only one number that counts, and it's number one. Right? Number one. Messiah. It's what he has to say that matters. No doubt, you know, they had a lot of this going on. Because whenever you have hypocritical religious leaders, you've got a lot of people acting like this. Because they themselves do this. So, you know, this is why I'm going into this. Kind of behind the picture here of what was going on. So, I just have down here about leverage of social pressure and how to deal with that. Don't take sides. You know, sometimes people are well-meaning when they do this, or seem to be, but it's the wrong thing to do. Don't take sides against someone, because you could end up being on the wrong side. And if you do, then there's all kinds of bad consequences that could come to you, right? And why should you even do that? Because, like, Messiah said, why am I your judge? Right? So it's very, very good to know when something is none of our business and we should stay out of it. And I think it's pretty cool that Messiah did that. He didn't just assume, well, because I'm Messiah, everything's my business. You know he thinks that way about you? Some things are your business. You're given free will. You're given an ability to choose. Some things are up to you to choose. That's how he is. You really have free will. You know, in some Christian circles, they have this kind of idea, like you have to totally give up your whole personhood somehow and just sort of meld into the cosmic Jesus and no longer have an existence of your own. That is not what he wants from us. He wants you to be the best person that you can be as his follower. You know, he gave everybody different talents and gifts, and we all have different points of view, which is a good thing. And we're not to just sort of meld into the cosmic Jesus. We're supposed to be a person. And how can he have a relationship with us if we're not a person that can make some decisions on our own? You know, the scriptures tell us we need to grow up into full maturity. That involves being able to make decisions, to take responsibility for things. You know, we don't need the Spirit of God to tell us things that we already know from the scriptures. Sometimes the Spirit will remind us about those things, but they're in the Scriptures. You know them. You can make a good decision. 
So Messiah knows this. Well, another little thing about this, gossip. In a way, what this guy was doing was gossip, wasn't it? But instead of doing it one at a time, he was doing it 10,000 at a time. There's lots of verses in the scriptures about gossip, and we really have to watch out for it because it's extremely hurtful and harmful. Now, gossip is different from slander, but basically, in the scriptures, what it means is harmful speech. So it might be true, or it might not be true, but it's wrong to spread it around either way. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are a snare to his soul. The words of a gossip are like dainty morsels. They go down into a person's innermost parts. You know, once you've heard such and such about so-and-so, well, it might be true. And it changes how you see people. Why do you think the news media is constantly spreading lies against people they don't like. Because many times it's proven wrong, but it still sticks in people's minds. In the multitude of words, there's no lack of disobedience, but he who restrains his lips does wisely. So what a fantastic example from Messiah that he just wasn't going to step into that, right? He just shut that down before it could even go anywhere. Well, we have a means to deal with things like this man's conflict with his brother. Matthew 18 tells us this. If your brother sins against you, go, show him his fault between you and him alone. That's what Messiah says to do. Now, this does not involve any gossip. It doesn't involve getting anybody on your side. It doesn't even involve, you know, getting some spiritual leader or something to agree with you and make it happen, like this guy was trying to do with Messiah. It's something that you do with the other person. And it says, if he listens to you, you've gained back your brother. You see... If you're all mad and spiteful, is your goal going to be to gain back your brother? But isn't the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself? So, really, the goal should be to gain back your brother, right? Well, how likely is your brother going to be to resolve an issue with you if you've already brought it up with a lot of other people and told them how bad that guy is? Are you going to be able to then resolve that conflict? Not easily. So does Messiah actually expect us to behave like this? To control what we say for the sake of other people? I mean, after all, a lot of people around us do these things. The truth is he does expect us to do this because this is what love is. This is what loving your brother looks like. This is where loving your brother is tested when some issue like this comes up. This is testing you. And if you don't pass the test, then... You're no better than whatever it is you're thinking he did to you, right? The mouth of the righteous is a spring of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all wrongs. Now, that's exactly opposite to what a lot of people think, that if somebody's doing something wrong, you need to expose it. But if this is your brother... Love covers all wrongs. Your purpose should not be to sort out all your brother's dirty laundry in front of other people. 
your purpose should be to gain back your brother. So that's why you would cover those wrongs and just talk to them about it. That's the thing that the scriptures tell us to do. Now, you might say, well, he's not going to listen. Well, you still have to go through those steps. You might be wrong. You might find that when you talk to that person, they might say to you, well, I didn't even realize that that was going to hurt you. That happens quite a bit. And the person will be more than willing to reconcile with you and to make it right, whatever it is. But if you have a person who has wronged you and it's a significant thing, you can't just forgive, and they won't listen to you, it tells us if he doesn't listen, take two or three witnesses with you. Well, what is a witness? Is a witness somebody that you've talked to? that is simply going to give you moral support? Or is a witness somebody that has witnessed the same thing? It's obvious, isn't it? So again, this isn't about drumming up support. This is about justice. That's what this is about justice. Well, what if he really did it, but there are no other witnesses? Oh, there's always another witness. Can you trust him to resolve it? You might have to be patient, right? But let's say there are two or three witnesses, and they come, and they try to persuade him as well and turn him around, but, and we're talking about serious issues here, right? Like the Ten Commandment kinds of issues, things like that. Well, then it needs to be taken to the assembly, which generally refers, like it does in the Torah, to the elders of the assembly. And then it needs to be judged there. So it's still not something that's being shopped around through the congregation. So I think it's important that we all understand these things because as Yahweh's nation grows, these things are going to keep becoming more and more important. And all of us who were here first, people are going to be looking to us in these situations to know what to do. So we all need to understand these things for the good of our larger community. So here are some of the kingdom values that we've seen in just these 15 verses. The truth cannot be stopped. Do not fear those who kill the body. Fear Elohim. Elohim will not forget you. Don't be afraid. Confess him and he will confess you. Trust the Holy Spirit for an answer. Mind your own business. Manipulation and gossip are evil. And keep yourself from covetousness. Well, that's a lot of treasure to have in your treasure chest from just 15 verses. But we got some more. Now, he's explaining about covetousness. And I think he kind of gets a picture from this man that was so anxious about his inheritance that he couldn't even hear these spiritual truths from Messiah, realizing that it was covetousness in his heart, putting the material things first that was preventing him from receiving these treasures of the kingdom. So he spoke this parable. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth abundantly, he reasoned within himself, saying, what will I do because I don't have room to store my crops? He said, this is what I'll do. I'll pull down my barns, build bigger barns, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. I'll tell my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But Elohim said to him, you foolish one, tonight your soul is required of you. 
the things which you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward Elohim. I feel bad for people like that. They're so blind. You know, life is so short. After you have what you need, what can you add to your life? You know, to your happiness, to your joy. Is uh, having a bigger bank account, is that going to make you feel better? Is that going to give you more happiness? You know, after you have the things you need, after that, it just becomes covetousness, doesn't it? Wanting, wanting, wanting more. And you can't take it with you. And then on that day, if all you have is a life spent trying to enrich yourself, how's that going to feel standing before Messiah to give an account of your life? Kind of a scary thing. And once you get all the stuff, then what? More stuff? Is that really going to make you happy? You know, I've read a thing about lottery winners, and I thought it was very interesting. The vast majority of them end up miserable. They think it's going to make them happy, but all the money ends up destroying all the relationships with everybody, and they end up being miserable. Having all the stuff, it's not the answer. It won't make you happy. I thought this one was funny, too. Many people want to serve God, but only in an advisory position. That's how it usually is, right? The scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, it's through giving that we really find joy. Through giving to the kingdom. Through serving Messiah, serving others. This is how we really express our love for Elohim, our love for our brothers. It's through what we actually do. Giving of ourselves, giving of our resources. This is what actually builds up treasure for us in heaven. Being held for that day. Then we have these verses. And Richard shared them very well for us. With Messiah telling us not to be anxious. For what? Our new Cadillac, our big house? Not even that. Today's food. Close to where? Today. Not much. Life's necessities. That's all we really need is the necessities for this day. Don't be anxious. Is that hard? Sometimes it seems like it. These things get tested, don't they? You know, I think it's interesting. I, I think that maybe some of his disciples had problems with this because he finishes up here saying, oh, you of little faith. I think sometimes his disciples had difficulty with this. And we have some things, like for instance, with all the people there. Oh, where are we going to get food to feed all these people? And I think sometimes, you know, it happens with us. We don't always remember these truths. And sometimes we are anxious. Well, if we are, our Father in Heaven wants to hear us. We can take our anxiety to Him 
and he already knows if we have anxiety, right? So we might as well go and talk to him about it. We're not perfect. Sometimes we are of little faith. That's why we need these truths. Because they help us. They lift us up to a higher place. But the truth is exactly what he says. That our Father in Heaven does love us. Oh, but what about the Great Tribulation? What about the mark of the beast? What about when no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark? Well, one well-known Christian teacher said, well, in that case, you can take the mark and God will forgive you. I don't think he read this. Because if he had read this, then he would know that if you're not anxious about what you're going to eat, where your food is coming from, where your clothes are coming from, but you put the kingdom first, then you don't have to worry about it, mark or no mark. Am I right? I don't know how that works. We'll find out when we get there. But, hey, Yahweh's bigger, okay? The Antichrist can probably puff his chest out pretty big, but the real Christ is bigger. You don't have to worry. And this is going to continue to be true, no matter what happens. It's going to continue to be true. It's the nations that are worried about all this stuff. And they ought to be. You know why? Because they're trying to go it alone without Yahweh. So they have to worry about everything, every little detail. They have to, you know, dot every I and cross every T because it all depends on them. I think that's too much of a burden myself. I can't handle that, I'll tell you that right now. That's too big for me. I don't know how those people even get through life. So I prefer to seek Elohim's kingdom. Because doing that, all those other things are added. So just putting his kingdom first, that's something I can do. I don't have to be obsessed with all these little details about my life. Put my king, the kingdom first every day. And then what happens? Obviously, I'm well fed. I have clothes to wear. I'm doing just fine, thank you. Thank him. He does take care of us when we put the kingdom first. These things are real. This is kingdom treasure. These things are real. You know, this sounds like a fairy tale to the nations because they have no faith. They don't have any knowledge of him. They've never met him. Once you know him, you know this is true, especially once you walk in it. So he says, don't be afraid, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You know that's why we who are his are here. This is our time of testing. You know, our big brother, Yeshua, he was tested. He suffered. You're going to be a king someday. You need to be tested. You need to be tried. This is your time for that to happen. Don't be surprised about it. You know, I was watching some of my brothers through this rainstorm this week. They were being tested and tried out there. But they overcame. They overcame. We are overcomers. We are getting stronger. We are 
getting better. We are getting more like him. Our weaknesses are being exposed so that they can be built up. We are being prepared for something better. Our Father wants to give us the kingdom. We are his children. We are storing up treasure. And one day we're going to cash it in. We're going to cash it in when we see him. And all the things he's promised are going to come our way. It will happen. So, friends, don't let the things of this world get you down. Have that spiritual point of view. See beyond what's happening now. See with your spiritual eyes what's really happening in your life. You are beloved. There is a purpose for all of this. Sell that what you have and give gifts to the needy. In other words, put love for others ahead of yourself. What you have, they're kingdom resources. Use them the way he leads you. Make for yourselves purses which don't grow old, a treasure in the heavens that doesn't fail, where no thief approaches, neither moth destroys. You know, a few years ago, we had a fire go through here and it burned up everything. But it didn't burn up everything. It didn't burn up our faith. It didn't burn up our commitment to the kingdom. It didn't burn up the love of our Father for us. It didn't burn up our hope. It burned up everything else, and it was all left in ashes. And we don't care, because all the good things, the most important things, we still have. This is absolutely true, isn't it? It's absolutely true. The enemy can't touch the things that really matter. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Absolutely true. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Kingdom treasure. Was this video informative? Click the like button below to help spread the word to others. Feel free to leave a comment and share your thoughts. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell so you won't miss out on more amazing content from Ayahu Ben David. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. You know, the apostles, they were Torah scholars. This is why I'm doing Zion Academy. The lessons include two-hour audio programs and quiz modules. All the lessons in the Torah can be applied to us today. Not to mention, they open up the Renewed Covenant Scriptures in a whole new level, much like the apostles had understanding of the Torah. Plus, I can do the courses in my own time, at my own pace with no prerequisites, and at a very low cost. I can do them here. Or here. Zion Academy students are provided with study materials, the Zion Messianic Scriptures, in-depth verse-by-verse programs and quizzes with your final grade and a certificate at the end of the course. Zion Academy also offers assignments for students who would like to opt in to take part in the Zion Tabernacle Live Shabbat meetings. Become immersed in the Torah. Find out how you can become a Zion Academy student at zion.org.